Hey everybody, in continuation of my video that was uploaded on hedge fund structure, talking about the master feeder structure, which is the basic kind of structure for hedge funds, let's discuss the differences between an open-ended fund and a closed-ended fund. In hedge funds, this is completely different from what is the context used in mutual funds, okay? So in mutual funds, we might be familiar about open-ended funds and closed-ended funds. In hedge funds, this structure is very important, not only to decide the timing of entry and exit, but also to decide what and how the fees are going to be paid by the limited partners to the asset management company. Hi everybody, I'm a learning partner Sushila Hariharan. If you're interested in a career in fund accounting, corporate action, straight life cycle and OTC derivatives, do subscribe to my YouTube channel where we as a team are focused on providing content-centric, research-focused content on this matters. Hedge funds are normally driven by the sponsor and the general partner and the limited partner. In most cases, the sponsor and the general partner are the similar kind of entities. Okay, so in, in fact, they, the sponsor could be the general partner also. The limited partner, on the other hand, is a partner who just brings in capital contribution to the hedge fund. So the general partner with the sponsor come together, set up the asset management company, they run the operations, they take investing decisions, they do the equity research, the fixed income research, the currency research, asset allocation, everything is done by the general partner. The limited partner is confined to capital contribution and does not participate in the day-to-day -day activities of the hedge fund. More about this has already been elaborated in other videos and we providing links of all the three videos that you have to see in conjunction with this so as to get a complete and comprehensive idea about what is the hedge fund role of the partners. Fees. Fees in a hedge fund typically comprise two types of fees, the management fees and the incentive fees. The management fees is ch charged as a percentage of uh, assets under management and the incentive fees is charged as a percentage of overperformance by the fund manager. So management fees is taken as a percentage of assets under management and it could range between 1.5 to 2% depending upon the assets under management. This also varies depending upon whether the structure of the fund is open-ended and closed-ended. That's why I have brought up this slide right up over here. Performance fees is charged as a percentage of outperformance by be beating the benchmarks against which the hedge fund is parametered and therefore performance fees also will take into consideration the difference between the performance of the hedge fund manager and the underlying benchmark. The distribution of performance fees also is dependent upon the structure of whether the fund is an open-ended fund or a closed-ended fund. We are going to be discussing each of these points in greater detail as we scroll through. The structure of the fund could be open-ended fund or a closed-ended fund. Where is this mentioned? This will be mentioned in the limited partnership agreement signed in between the limited partners and the asset management company. The differences are dramatically different from what is there in a mutual fund. So therefore, I urge you to pay closer attention to, to these concepts of open-ended fund and closed-ended fund. A closed-ended fund has a pre-fixed life. This means that the fund has to live its life of about seven years, eight years, nine years, whatever it is. This prefixed life, the fund has a prefixed life. That means the fund could either run for seven years, eight years, or nine years. Now, in a closed ended fund, because the duration of the fund is predetermined, partners make in capital commitment at the start of the fund. Okay? or at the time of committing to the fund. This normally is, uh, you know, literally accompanied with the signing of the limited partnership agreement because the capital commitment has to be known to the fund manager beforehand, before he can allow or permit the limited partner to contribute to the capital. The capital commitment can be drawn down during the life of the fund and therefore the capital is not a one-time in investment by the limited partner into the hedge fund. 
Okay, this has to be very, very clear in the case of closed ended funds because we got to understand the capital in commitment is a very integral part of a closed ended fund. The admission into the fund is through this capital commitment. Okay, so in a closed ended fund, you got to look out for the terms like capital commitment, which is a commitment made at the start of the partnership. But the money can be drawn down by the asset management company at any point of time during the life of the fund. When I say any point of time, this any point of time is predetermined and mentioned in the agreement. Okay, so it's not on a daily basis, but it is perhaps on an annual basis or once in three years, etc. This redemption, how does the investor get back the money then? The investor gets back the money when the fund is wound up. This is called as redemption. So in a closed ended fund, you have a start date, you have an end date. Capital commitments happen at the start date. During the period between the start date and the end date, the LPs can contribute the capital, which is sucked out of the capital commitment and put into the fund. On the end date, the fund is wound up and the redemption proceeds are distributed amongst the partners. This is a little different in the case of an open-ended fund. In an open-ended fund, there is no specific term to the fund's life and the fund is wound up when the partners decide to do so. So there is no predetermined life of the fund. So you see, sometimes funds can wind up as well, right? So then they wind up without any uh, term that is mentioned to the fund's life. The capital contribution is at the time of admission into the fund. The concept of capital commitment is very exclusive to a closed ended fund. In the case of an open ended fund, you use the term capital contribution. Admission and redemption of capital takes place at regular intervals. Okay, so investor can choose when to exit a fund. The fund need not be wound up just to pay off the investors. On winding up, the existing investors will get the payouts. That's a different story. But over here, the admission and the redemption of capital takes place at regular intervals. A closed-ended fund is different also in terms of the fee structure. Let's take a look at what are the management fees charged by a closed-ended fund. A closed-ended fund has a tiered structure of management fees. When I say tiered, remember in a closed-ended fund, there is only capital commitment. Yeah, so management fees have to be charged as a percentage of AUM or assets under management. So then in the case of a closed ended fund, there are two tiers. The first tier is management fees are charged as a percentage of capital commitments and management fees are charged as a percentage of capital contributions. Okay, because you just can't be paying management fees for commitments, right? You have to pay for actual money that goes into the fund. Therefore, the limited partners will pay management fees only as a percentage of capital contribution and a very minuscule percentage of capital commitment. On the other hand, in the case of a close, uh, in the case of an open-ended fund, the management fees are a percentage of NAV if the hedge fund is unitized. Okay, if the hedge fund is not unitized and it's an investor allocation kind of a fund then it's the percentage of balance of the capital account of each of those investors. The capital account is therefore marked to market. Whatever is the value at the end of that valuation exercise of marking to market, the fund then charges the management fees to the limited partners. Performance fees also are very different in the case of closed-ended fund and uh, open-ended fund. Let's take a look at how are closed-ended funds charging performance fees. The performance fees is usually called as the carry and carried interest is based on the profits realized from the exit of the fund. Okay, so when the fund exits, uh, when, the fund, when the fund winds up and the partners start looking at receiving their Returns from the fund, the first thing to be paid out of the capital contribution, the second is to be paid out of the prefs, then we have the returns that is distributed by way of carried interest to both the general partner and the limited partner. This is called as a waterfall distribution. I've already uploaded a video on waterfall distribution, the link of which is shared in the comment section below. Open-ended funds, on the other hand, charge incentive fees 
where the performance fees is equalized. Remember, in an open-ended fund, investors enter and exit at different points of time. Therefore, different investors enter and different investors exit at different points of time. This means that new investors may or may or may not have an advantage over existing investors. Okay, so what are the disadvantages that could occur? Let's take an example of a free ride. Okay, <laughs> a free ride, unlike an Uber paid ride. Okay, Uber rides are all paid, etc. So you have to have a, uh, you know, you have to have your uh, wallet loaded, or you have to be ready with your uh, UPI to pay, the, make the payments. But in the case of a free ride, investor A buys a share in a fund at hundred dollars, and the NAV of the fund increases to hundred and ten dollars. So now, obviously, investor A has to pay the incentive fee, right? So the investor pays the incentive fee. The seal, sealed, signed, and delivered. Okay? So the incentive fees is locked in. It is paid by investor A. After this, the NAV comes down to 100 again. And at this point of time, investor B buys a share at $100. Okay, so investor A has bought at 100, it went up to 110, it came back to 100. Investor B now buys at the new 100. Investor B pays incentive fees only if NAV exceeds 110, right? Because investor A has already paid incentive fees when it has gone from 100 to 110. Now only if it exceeds 110, investor B has to pay because 110 now has become the high water mark. So therefore, who suffers? Who benefits? Explain in the comment section below. I'm curious to know what you're thinking about between investor A or investor B who is suffering in this scenario of an open-ended fund. There's also the concept of clawback of incentive fees where limited partners clawback excess incentive fees paid to the general partner. How does this excess arise? This excess can arise on account of multiple occasions. Okay, one great year some miscalculations, any of these excesses can arise and therefore the limited partners will claw back the incentive fees from the general partner. In an American waterfall, which is basically an incentive based methodology depending upon deal by deal for the payment of incentive fees, the excessive incentive fees is paid to the general partner, limited partners will claw back the excess. You understand? So let's say in the case of a particular exit of company A, where the hedge fund has earned phenomenal returns. But in the case of hedge, uh, company B, the returns have been negative. So you have overpaid for outperformance in the case of investing in company A, but you have underperformed in the case of investing in company B. So therefore, the excess fees that have been paid for investing in company A will be clawed back by the limited partners. So what do you think? Can we have a clawback in a European waterfall system? No, we cannot have because in a European waterfall, it's a comprehensive altogether exit of the fund uh, at, at any point of time. Thank you so much for listening in. If you're interested in more content like this, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you.